Good afternoon. I'm John Tomasi. I'm the director of the Political Theory Project. I'm tempted to instruct you on how to adjust your seatbelts, but I won't. Um, the Political Theory Project is dedicated to encouraging conversations on campus about the institutions and ideas that might make societies simultaneously free, prosperous, and fair. One of the main things we do is encourage students or create opportunities for students to take leadership roles about the character of conversations on campus about political issues. Part of the way we do that is by trying to stay out of the way of students, and I do my best to stay out of their way. And with that spirit, I want to introduce Andrea Matthews, the co-executive director of the Janus Forum, who will be running tonight's event. Andrea. Good afternoon. Uh, again, my name is Andrea Matthews, and I'm the co-director of the Janus Forum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our 16th Janus Lecture entitled, In God We Trust, Religion and Public Life. Uh, we're joined today by two experts on the topic, and I think we're going to have a really great conversation, so I'm going to keep my introduction very short. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the Janus Forum and how we were founded. Uh, the Janus Forum is a student group that seeks to encourage and elevate the level of thought, debate, and discussion about political and social ideas at Brown. We were started about four years ago by a couple of students who thought that Brown could do better than just bring one speaker on with just one opinion to lecture our community. Their idea was that students' views should be the product of well-rounded and critical thought, and that the strongest beliefs are those that have been actively challenged. It was in that spirit that the students started the Janus Lecture Series, which brings two or more speakers to provide a space where Brown students can challenge their own ideas, explore diverse beliefs, and arrive at their own conclusions, not only understanding what they believe, but why they believe it. And today, the Janus Forum continues to provide that space through multiple other venues. We host Janus Conversations, which are short lectures with Brown professors. We hold Janus lunches at the Faculty Club, where students can enjoy a free lunch while discussing a political topic. And we host student debates through the Janus Political Union. I want to take a quick moment to uh, thank the people who make these events possible. Firstly, thank you to the 2009 Executive Board for a year of great work and for your continued support. Secondly, thank you and welcome to the 2010 Executive Board, which is looking forward to another year of hard work, I hope. And finally, none of this would be possible without the support of the Political Theory Project, which, as Professor Tomasi told you, is an independent research center at Brown dedicated to the study of institutions and ideas that make societies free, prosperous, and fair. But uh, let's get back to the topic at hand. We're here to discuss the fundamental issues concerning the role of religion in political life. Does, what is the role of religion in a pluralistic democratic society? Does a cohesive society need religion? Should religion be involved in politics? Two experts in the field are here to help us address these questions today. Through uh, the highly contentious process of alphabetical order, Professor Jose Casanova will speak first. Professor Casanova heads the Berkeley Center's program on globalization, religion, and the secular at Georgetown, and his published works include Rethinking Secularization, a Global Comparative Perspective. He will be followed by Professor Mark Leela, a professor of humanities at Columbia, who has contributed to the New York Review of Books, the New Republic, and the New York Times, and who published The Stillborn God, Religion, Politics, and the Modern West. After both of the speakers are finished, they'll have the opportunity to ask each other one question. And following that, we'll open up the debate to audience members who will have the chance to ask their own questions at either of the microphones. And finally, you're all invited to a catered reception in the lobby after the event. Uh, so now you've heard more than enough from me. So please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Professor Jose Casanova. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and a great honor to participate in this debate with uh, Mark Lila. Uh, in God We Trust, and I was surprised to see that Brown has as its motto, in God, in Deo Esperamos, which of course can be translated either in God we hope or waiting for God. Um, for God, waiting for Godot. Uh, 
I'm not a normative political theorist. I'm a comparative historical social scientist. So I'm going to address the questions that Andrea just uh, uh, read, uh, not from a normative perspective, but to illustrate the range of possibilities across democratic societies. There is no single model of either secular state or of how to separate religion and politics and how to uh, involve religion in public life. There are many, many different historical variations. What is clear is that some of the assumptions we had for a long time concerning the privatization of religion and that religion was going to become increasingly irrelevant in modern societies and in public life, these assumptions have been seriously put into question in the last, let's say, 30 years. We could say the turning point was 1979, when simultaneously around the world you have the emergence of, well, first the Pope, the Polish Pope and the emergence of solidarity in Poland, the Islamic Revolution in Iran, the emergence of the moral majority in American electoral politics that led to the election of Ronald Reagan and the emergence of the Christian right that has been a, a crucial factor in American politics since then, the Nicaraguan Revolution in Latin America bringing liberation theology into the center of Latin American politics. So you had what I call the deprivatization of religion, emerging in all worlds of development, and therefore put into question the model of secularization and privatization of religion. Um, so now the question is which kind of role should religion play in public life in democratic societies? The answer will be, of course, it is up to the citizens to decide which role, if any, it's going to play. And the answer is going to depend very much from historical trajectories of different countries, the kind of settlements that they have uh, institutionalized, either as constitutional frameworks or institutional arrangements or cultural norms. It's very clear that the American model, based on the dual clause of no establishment of religion at the state level and free exercise of religion in society is very different from the French laicite model and is very different from other types of secular states, Indian secularism or Chinese secularism or even Turkish secularism despite uh, using the same name of laicite. But it's also very different from, from many other European societies. In fact, despite the kind of assumption that most European societies are deeply secular. In terms of state church arrangements, you still have Christianity established in a lot of European democratic societies. Indeed, every branch of Christianity, with the exception of the Catholic Church, is established in European democracies. The Anglican Church in England, the Presbyterian Church of Scotland in Scotland, the Lutheran churches in every Nordic country, with the exception of Sweden, where it was only disestablished in the year 2000, the Orthodox Church uh, in Greece. So, obviously, the question of which kind of relation is there going to be between religion and politics, church and state, varies even across Western democratic societies. Indeed, you could say that every, in every case, the key question is which type of separation there is between church and state or between religion and politics. And it's a question of degrees of separation. There is never a perfect separation anywhere. And which kind of regulation of religion in society, how much the state regulates, controls, or not, the free exercise of religion and how pluralist this free exercise of religion is across European societies. Now, we can make, in general, uh, the kind of comparison between Europe and the United States, despite the fact of the, the great diversity within Europe itself. But paraphrasing Karl Marx, in on the Jewish question, one could say that the United States is, on the one hand, the land of perfect disestablishment and the land of religiosity par excellence. Namely, it has what could be called the perfect secular state, and it has the most religious society. While European countries in general 
are deeply secular societies, they are lands of secularity with very imperfect secular states, namely with a lot of legacies of establishment still as being parts of the state. The main comparison or difference is the very different type of religion, the very different trajectories. One could say the difference between confession, which is the name which religions have in Europe, and denomination, which is the name which religions have in the United States. The process of secularization in Europe is a process of disestablishment, a process of deconfessionalization. While in the United States, there was no previous establishment, there was no confessional state from which the state had to, or the churches had to be disestablished. And this is a fundamental difference because in Europe, the fundamental fact, which has to a certain extent uh, led to our secularist assumptions, is the fact that since early modernity, especially with the Westphalian arrangements following the religious wars, you have not so much the secularization of the state, at least not at first, not religious pluralism or religious freedom, but actually the establishment of the principle cuius regio eius religio, which means the territorialization of religion and churches and the confessionalization of states nations and peoples. So there was the need to deconfessionalize the state, deconfessionalize the nation, and deconfessionalize the people. And this is the fundamental transformation of European societies of the last 300 years. In the case of the United States, there was no previous process of confessionalization from which people or even the state had to be deconfessionalized. Even in the case of the established churches in the colonies. Those were really minority churches. Only an elite, a minority elite, were members of the church. The majority of ordinary people were not confessionally tied to the churches. Neither the congregational churches in New England, nor the Anglican churches in the southern colonies. And we know historically that actually the churching of the American people took place after independence through evangelical revivals. So there is a fundamental different relationship between religious mobilization, religious individualism, and you could say modern politics in the United States than in Europe. And this, to a certain extent, explains also the different attitudes to our religion and politics, where in Europe it is assumed that religion should be a private affair, should not enter politics. This assumption is much more difficult to maintain in the United States, where religion has been at the center of political mobilization, uh, basically since the time of uh, uh, the Second Great Awakening, through uh, um, the mobilizations against abolitionism, uh, against abolition, uh, the civil rights movement, of course, in the 1960s. So it is much more difficult to argue for the privatization of religion, namely the separation of church and state, which is, of course, a constitutional framework, doesn't mean at all the separation of religion and politics. In fact, while liberal political theories share the secularist assumptions that the public sphere should be a secular sphere, Think of theories like John Rawls, or Jürgen Habermas, or Bruce Ackerman. The actual political scientists doing empirical analysis of really existing democratic societies. Let's say people like Robert Dahl, or Juan Linz, or Liebhardt. None of them have any premise that either the democratic state has to be secular, or that democratic policies have to be secular. Because they know that de facto, this is not the case. So the question is not whether religion in the abstract should have a role in public life, but the real question, interesting question, is which kind of religion in which kind of particular context? And then the answer has to be, of course, uh, the same way in which any ans anybody answers any political question. Uh, nobody answers whether the family is good or bad, whether economics in the abstract is good or bad. This very question of religion in the abstract, whether it should enter politics or not, 
is itself a kind of evidence of uh, the secularist assumptions and the way in which we have constructed this abstract theory of religion. Um, In 1994, when I published Public Religious in the Modern World, and I proposed uh, the theory of deprivatization of religion, both as a new norma, as a new empirical trend, but also as uh, arguing that there was no normative grounds to try to privatize religion or to keep religion away from the public sphere. At the time, I argued for public religion in civil society, namely in the public sphere of civil society, without entering political society or the state. Uh, in a certain sense, since then, I have been revisiting my own position. And the moment one enters into comparative analysis beyond the West, one has to open up the analysis uh, of political religion beyond civil society, uh, put into question the thesis of differentiation of the spheres, which we have assumed as a European model that is repeated around the world, and realize that once we once go beyond the West, not only to Muslim societies, but to India, to China, that all these issues emerge in radically new forms. And we are entering precisely, I think, a contemporary global moment in which our assumptions concerning what the Eurocentric teleological model of European Western development was for the rest of the world is being put into question. Now, of course, we may regret this new development saying, well, it's simply evidence of the resurgence of religious fundamentalism against secular modernity. And we may, of course, defend a secularist position. But the important thing is to defend, if we defend a secularist position, that we defend it on normative grounds and not because this is what to be modern means. Namely, to use modernization theory to defend, if you wish, a secularist position. And here is actually interesting, again, to compare the American and the European experience to see how people lie differently to the pollsters. Now, we know that people lie, but they lie in different directions. When you ask Americans how frequently they go to church, how frequently they pray, they lie, and they say they go more frequently than they actually go, and they pray more frequently than they actually pray. We know that because precisely those, my colleagues, who defend the theory of secularization and want, want to prove that actually secularization also happens in the United States, have shown that you cannot trust the people telling you the truth. But the interesting question is that in Europe they lie in the opposite direction. They hide their own religiosity and claim they are more <laughs> secular than they really are. So for me the question is not that people are still are more secular than they claim to be here or are more religious than they claim to be in Europe, but why do they lie in different directions? Why Americans believe that to be a good American means to be religious, while in Europe Europeans believe that to be a good modern European, enlightened European, means to be secular. This is for me the interesting question. How it has become part of the taken for granted assumption of how these societies work. And it itself then becomes a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. American religiosity, of course, to a certain extent, uh, uh, continues um, its vitality precisely because of this assumption while the theory of secularization became a self-fulfilling prophecy in Europe. We know this to a certain extent also the evidence we have from immigration. Um, it was already observed by European visitors in the 19th century that people, even in European immigrants, were more religious in America than they were in Europe. And this same observation, that immigrants today, whether Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, Christians, are more religious in America than they were in the home country, is evidence we have also from uh, contemporary studies of immigration. At least this is also what immigrants tell about themselves once they are in the United States. 
And of course, the question is why this is so. And I would argue that the question has to do precisely with the model of denominationalism that has emerged in the United States. It's a system of religious pluralism based on the mutual recognition of religious group. Denominations is, denomination is only the name I give to myself as a group and by which I am recognized by others. But it's a process of mutual recognition within civil society, practically without a state intervention. In fact, the state, the government, has no right to ask uh, the denomination of its citizens. That's why we have no official data of how many Muslims or how many Catholics or how many Buddhists are in the United States, because neither the census nor the immigration naturalization service have the right to ask the religion of the citizens. And yet, it is a fundamental fact of American life that societal pluralism is organized precisely through these religious identities. And that when immigrants come to the United States, then they assume also this religious identity as a primary aspect of their group identity. Now, if this is the case, then of course to argue religion should not play a role in politics when it's a crucial factor in social life. Of course, you can only do that if you try to disenfranchise religious citizens. So for a democratic society in which the citizens are deeply religious, to argue religion should not enter public life is a form of disenfranchising religious citizens. On the other hand, in, the other hand, in Europe, where precisely most citizens view themselves as secular, and they have actually abandoned the churches they have become deconfessionalized and understand this as a process of liberation, emancipation from religion, then of course the assumption that politics should, free, should be free from religion precisely because the state should be free, free from the church is a natural historical experience which resonates within the European experience. So, The argument I'm making is that the questions we are addressing are concrete questions that will have um, different responses in different contexts. And there is no perfect or ideal normative model that should be generalized for every democratic society. Neither the American system would work in France, and the French certainly would not accept it, nor Americans are going to import laicite. But neither are the Germans going to import either the American or the French system. If there is such a variation and such a multiplicity of ways of being modern, religious, and secular, even within the modern Christian secular West, then one can assume that the variety is only going to be greater as the rest of the world also modernizes and transform its societies. Indeed, while up to, let's say, 20 years ago, the focus of all research had been on religion and the problem of religion, today I would argue in the last, certainly the last decade, the most interesting developments, both within religious studies, but also within the social sciences, has been in the need to look at religion and the secular as two mutually constituted fields and phenomena, and mutually constituted in very different ways, in very different contexts. There is a very famous uh, 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 joke, many of you have, may have heard it, Northern Ireland, somebody crossing from a Protestant to a Catholic uh, uh, district, hands up, where are you, Protestant or Catholic? No, I'm an atheist, but which one? <laughs> there is such a thing as a neutral, secular individual. The kind of assumption we have of secularity as being the kind of the natural humanity, what remains when we get rid of this superstructural thing that we call religion, this assumption we had is obviously false. The secular itself is constituted by the religious and the religious is constituted by the secular. And so the interesting question is then, to begin thinking how these things are interconnected and to begin seeing how 
when we think we are the most secular, we are actually reproducing perhaps particular religious patterns that come from history. So I would argue for Europeans, it's very hard to understand what American religion is because they see it so secularized, so mundane, and the boundaries are not clear at all. Indeed, in the United States, uh, the boundaries of the religious and the secular are not clearly framed despite the wall of separation. While in Europe, they were relatively reasonably maintained because everybody knew what religion was, ecclesiastical institutions. One religion becomes a republican religion of citizens. The attempt to simply solve these questions through legal constitutional arrangements becomes much more problematic. So uh, I have not given you an answer to this question. I have only told you the answers will change from place to place, from historical moment to historical moment. There is no ideal normative solution of how to separate religion and politics, to which extent religion should play a role in public life. Ultimately, in democratic societies, it's up to the citizens to decide how these things should play out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Casanova. Now, please help me welcome Professor Mark Lilla. The question posed is, uh, what is the role of religion in public life, particularly in pluralistic democratic societies? Well, I'd like to begin answering the question by making a distinction between two sorts of problems that this question might be related to. The first is the role of religious belief and practice in an established political order. The second is the place of theology in establishing a political order. Now, in the United States, we're mainly used to talking about the first problem. We assume we have a liberal pluralistic democracy. We know which rights uh, people should have to practice their religion. And we ask ourselves what influence it should have on public policy, what the limits of toleration are, what constraints can be put on religious communities, what constraints religious communities can put on their members, and so on. This is the problem of church and state. And there are lots of books in the library and in the bookstore here trying to find the right answer. But as Jose Casanova has just said, it turns out there isn't just one answer even in the West. It turns out you can wear a headscarf to school in Holland. You can't do that in France. Germany pays its ministers with public funds. Ireland doesn't. Canada and Britain give public funds to religious schools. This is un unconstitutional in the United States. Now, Professor Casanova, I think, stops there and just sees variety. I think, though, that we have to recognize that something unites the nations in the West today, liberal democracies in the West. It's not how they treat the problem of church and state and where they draw these lines. It's rather the principle by which they do it. And the principle that they all share is that human beings govern themselves. God doesn't. How did that principle get established? Well, that requires telling a bit of a story. We need to understand how we got from a world where God legitimately ruled over human beings to one in which human beings rule themselves. Only then, I think, can we get some perspective on the place that religious belief and practice can have in different kinds of societies. Now, historically, most civilizations known to us from ancient times to the present have legitimated public authority and institutions through some sort of political theology. Now, what do I mean by political theology? I mean specifically a doctrine that legitimates public authority 
and the institutions that exercise it on the basis of a divine revelation. In all these archaic societies, and many of them up until a millennium ago, um, were based on uh, the, um, a divine sanction. The laws had a divine sanction. And political discourse in those societies was essentially about how do we interpret that sanction. It's important in discussing this question that we distinguish theology from religion. Religion can be understood to be a belief or set of beliefs. It can be understood to be a set of social practices. Theology is an intellectual discipline. It's a way of thinking. It begins by assuming that there is a divinely revealed nexus between God, man, and the world, which it then proceeds to investigate rationally. Political theology, as I want to define it for today, derives political legitimacy from this nexus and the way it understands this nexus. Nothing more and nothing less. Why have most societies in human history been governed by a political theology? Well, there are historical reasons for that. Maybe it's a question actually we can't answer why. But we can see the attraction. And that is the political theology is comprehensive. It offers a way of thinking about the conduct of human affairs and connects those thoughts to loftier ones about the existence of God, the structure of the cosmos, the nature of the soul, the origin of all things, and the end of time. Now, as we know, for over a millennium, the West took inspiration from a, a particular image of the nexus between God, man, and world. It was a Christian image. It was an image of a triune God who ruled over a created cosmos and guided human beings by means of revelation, inner conviction, and the natural order. But it turned out that this theological picture was always difficult to translate into political form. And if you think about the nature of Trinitarianism, it's obvious why. The Messiah became flesh, much like an imminent God of the pagan nations. But he did not remain with here on earth. He departed, much like the absent God of the ancient Gnostics, with the promise to return at the end of time. Stranger still, this epoch in which we live is not the final one in human history. Rather, it contains within itself the promise of still another, an infinite stretch of time in which all things will be made new by the Messiah's return and God's last judgment. Now, this is a magnificent picture of divine and human relations. But from the beginning, it was not at all clear just what political lessons were to be drawn from it. Were Christians supposed to withdraw from a corrupted world that had been abandoned by the Redeemer? Or were they called upon to rule the earthly city with both church and state, inspired by the Holy Spirit? Or were they expected to build a new Jerusalem that would hasten the return of the Messiah? Well, as you know, throughout the Middle Ages, Christians were involved in endless disputes over just these questions. The city of man was set against the city of God, public citizenship against private piety, the divine right of kings against the right of resistance, church authority against radical antinomianism, canon law against mystical insight, inquisitor against martyr, secular sword against ecclesiastical power, um, prince against emperor, emperor against pope, pope against church councils. We all know this story. I wonder, though, whether we grasp its implications, especially for the way we think about religion and politics today. The profound problems, political problems, of Western Christendom were not accidental. They had roots deep in and solely in the ambiguities of one particular 
religion, Christianity, which never quite managed to develop a coherent and authoritative political doctrine given its commitment to this Trinitarian idea. Judaism has its halakha, Islam has its sharia, and those laws cover every aspect of human life for believers. But no such law exists in Christianity. All that exists is endless dispute about the believer's relation to the world and thus to political authority. The wars of religion that broke out around many of these problems didn't necessarily have to happen. There was a specific dispute in a particular area of the world, in a particular religion that had a particular theology. The problem to which modern government, and especially liberal democracy, is the answer is not a universal answer. The problem itself was not universal. It grew out of a very specific problem in our neck of the woods. And it's because of that that we need to, under, we need to understand that, to understand that the way we think about the problems of religion and politics today, not the answers we give to the question of church and state, but the way we even pose it, arises out of this crisis within Christendom and a new answer that was given, or rather a new approach to thinking about political affairs. And that new approach was inaugurated by Thomas Hobbes. Hobbes did not try to refute Christian political theology. He did not try to deny its claims. He did not try to replace it with another political theology. Rather, Hobbes changed the subject of political thought. He changed it from God and his commands to man and his beliefs about God. In the Leviathan, Hobbes showed the Christian West how to let God be when thinking about political legitimacy. He laid down a fiat from now on our political thinking will not begin with God's revelation in politics. Instead, it will begin with the nature of human beings as believers in God. And in doing that, Hobbes slyly replaced political theology with what we do now, which is essentially political anthropology. He made it possible for us to think about giving man, uh, um, think about man as the legitimate authority over himself and not God. Well, you learn about this all in your classes, but I want to put an emphasis on it for talking about the questions you've posed today. This was a distinctive break in the history of Western political thinking, but I think in the history of human political thought as well. There was a separation between two ways of thinking about the political problem from the point of view of God and his commands, or from the point of view of human nature and human beings as um, believers in God. Now, I want to say that this um, separation, let's, I call it the great separation uh, that Hobbes um, effected between political theology and the political philosophy we practice, is not the same as the separation of church and state. The problem of church and state is simply a Christian problem, a Christian and post-Christian problem. And throughout its history, even Christendom had different ways of separating out uh, authority between ecclesiastical and what were called secular authorities. The great separation that was effected by Hobbes was quite different. It offered a way of separating political discourse from theological discourse. Once that happened, we then had to take up the Christian problem of church and state, but from a different point of view. All right. Now, with that in mind, 
I'd then like to take up the questions that were posed to me by the uh, Janus group and suggest that the kind of problems that we generally talk about revolving around church and state are in fact not very serious in the West. That the real problem facing us today is political theology. The first question that we, uh, that we began with, let me just read it. Again, what is the role of religion in public life, particularly in pluralistic democratic societies? Well, the answer to that is that there is no fixed one. And I'm a little puzzled when I see book after book being published um, about trying to figure out exactly what is, uh, is um, let's say, morally and philosophically um, legitimate when it comes to distinguishing church and state. There's simply different ways to do it while at the same time accepting that human beings govern themselves. It's really a question of prudence and even of taste. It depends country by country what sort of religion you're dealing with. It even depends within a country what sorts of religions you're dealing with. It depends on the mix of population. It will depend on the structure of government, federalism, even the size of the country. But these are small problems. It, it, these are not fundamental questions. Second question that was posed by the group was whether a cohesive society needs religion. I don't know. And I think you shouldn't believe anyone who tells you he does know. We're finding out. There's something strange about this question, I think, because um, or something, um, it has a history. There's been tremendous nostalgia since the French Revolution in modern Western thought for a world in which, for essentially political theology. Um, it's the history of both political and religious romanticism. Um, I don't think we need an answer to the question. I think we can let that matter lie, and I think Hobbes would have. The question was also asked whether religion can contribute to political progress. And the people asking it had in mind things like the civil rights movement. Well, obviously it can. It's perfectly legitimate for Americans to take their religious beliefs into the voting booth or onto the campaign trail as long as they go home when the vote's over, which, astonishingly, they do. We have deep fundamental differences in this country over problems that would split other nations apart, over the beginnings of life, over how we teach our children, and so on. And somehow Americans manage to settle them by bringing their religious commitments to the public sphere while still recognizing the legitimacy of um, our institutions without reference to God's authority over us. All of these problems that we're invited to talk about, I think, are the minor ones. The real challenge, I think, today before us is to recognize that political theology is still out there. That political theology is still an alternative anywhere in the world where human beings think about the connection between political life and what lies beyond. Let me read you um, a little something. In May 2006, Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad sent a letter to President Bush. Now, this letter was translated in newspapers around the world. It was never translated, strangely, in this country. Its theme is contemporary politics, and the language is that of divine revelation. In this letter, which I urge you to look up online, President Ahmadinejad rehearses a list of grievances against American foreign policies, real and imagined. And then he wonders, and I quote, if Prophet Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Ishmael, Joseph, or Jesus Christ, peace be unto him, were with us today, how would they have judged such behavior? The president then offered the following prophecy. Liberalism and Western-style democracy have not been able to help realize the ideals of humanity. Today, these two concepts have failed. Those with insight can already hear the sounds of the shattering 
and the fall of the ideology and thoughts of the liberal democratic system. Whether we like it or not, the world is gravitating toward faith in the Almighty, and justice and the will of God will prevail over all things. That is the voice of political theology. And that is the challenge we face today in thinking about religion and politics. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Leela. We're now going to move to the question and answer part of this event, starting off with the speakers engaging one another by asking each other one question. Please. Is this working? Yeah. Um, following up on, on, on what I just said, I, I'd be curious to hear Professor Casanova talk about Iran. Uh, he began his talk with Iran, and he compared the resurgence of um, political, or, the, or not even resurgence, but the arrival of political Islam to Iran, compared that to what was happening in Poland when uh, the Pope arrived and rallied the troops of Solidarność, and also compared it to um, the rise of the moral majority in this country. And there's a kind of, um, it's a sociological approach to this problem that essentially sees societies as either secular, pre-secular, secular, or um, post-secular, or de-secularizing, as he said. It seems to me that the, that the uh, example of Iran points to a more fundamental problem that does not have to do with secularization. In fact, the term doesn't even apply to the situation in Iran. The challenge was to sovereignty and the legitimation of authority. Will this country, will the, the institutions of this country be legitimated through a, through a revelation or not? That decision was made. Now what has happened since, we can talk about what relation that bears to um, uh, the revolution in political theology in, in Iran. But it seems to me that that case points to a different kind of challenge than the secularization problem that um, Professor Casanova was talking about. Yes, indeed. Um, I did not compare the four cases. I only said that the same year appear these four cases in which very clearly religion entered the public sphere. And therefore, we were forced to rethink our assumptions about secularization, modernization, etc. Iran is indeed a fascinating case. On the one hand, you could say, well, it's just a modern Jacobin revolution. It obviously has been compared with the French Revolution, with the Soviet revolutions, and it's a modern revolution. Uh, but indeed, the question is that of sovereignty and that of political legitimacy. The unique answer of Iran was to establish dual sovereignty. On the one hand, modern political, democratic sovereignty, the people, the nation. On the other hand, the sovereignty of the scholars, the jurists, and therefore of God. And since then, this has been the problem of Iranian democracy or politics. Who has sovereignty? Hatami, that was elected by the majority of the people, or Khamenei, that was chosen as the representative of God. And what we see now in Iran happen is that these two principles cannot live with one another, and now we don't have dual sovereignty. We actually have triple sovereignty. We have, on the one hand, the principle still of democratic politics, the principle of the mullahs, the ulama, and ultimately we have now a military repressive regime, and basically eliminating both principles of legitimacy, and in which a regime has no other legitimacy but pure force. So indeed, the problem of the modern world is one of sovereignty. But the point I wanted to make is that this problem was not solved by hubs. Uh, indeed, for me, the interesting question is that the European solution 
of the absolutist state was by imposing a homogeneous uh, uniformity in society in the nation. The religious wars emerged because religious plurality emerged. And European kingdoms were not simply able nor willing to accept religious plurality in its midst. And they solved the problem of religious diversity but letting, letting the minorities emigrate. And this is the way Europe solved the problem of pluralism. And interestingly, in the transference of sovereignty from the monarch to the people or the nation, there was no change in the structure of diversity. Those societies remain homogeneous, uh, uniform, only now it changed their uniformity. There is no change in the structure of pluralism, certainly no emergence of religious diversity, nor with the expansion of democracy and universal suffrage. European societies didn't change. For 300 years, the confessional boundaries of the societies were kept uh, fixed, and the only movement was unchurching, people leaving the churches. It's only now with the coming of non-Europeans and different religions to Europe where the problem has emerged again. Now, uh, if I may, uh, the counter question that I may pose to yes, uh, and in the interest Professor of time, Mark Lila has to do with whether this story we've heard, whether this is not a very particular Judeo-Christian story and not the story of humanity. And indeed, it's a story that does not apply so well to ancient Greece, to ancient Rome. There was no divine revelation. It was the political, of course, they had political theologies. But they were very different from the one that comes out of the Judeo-Christian tradition. And indeed, with the axial revolutions, the political theology that emerged in Confucian China or in Buddhist societies are very different from the political theologies of the Judeo-Christian tradition. So indeed, I would agree, the fundamental problem of the West has been how to solve the problem of pluralism, pluralist democracy given the political theology these societies had. But in the case of precisely Asian societies, with very different political theologies, the issue has been very different. And so the interesting question for me is how today, the story we have told about how the world was going our direction, the direction of the West, is becoming problematic because as the globalization takes place, there is on the one hand a globalization of the Western model but it enters in tension with very different structures, with very different political theologies. So the models of political theologies are very different. And so the question is whether we do not need to open our story beyond the one we've heard, where perhaps then Hobbes is not so central to the story if we look at it from the perspective of the need to construct pluralist democratic societies. Briefly, Professor Lila. Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, well, I, I think there's less. Uh, it's often said that um, uh, non-Western political theologies are completely different from those uh, that derive from uh, the Abrahamic tradition. I, I just don't think it's true, and it's interesting to start comparing them. Or, or the, rather, the differences are not that great. If the emperor is divine. That seems to me to be, his every word does seem to me to be a revelation. I think the word revelation applies to a political th theology based on the divinity of the emperor, or even if the king is the sole um, interpreter and messenger. So if you look at ancient Near Eastern religions from Samaria through Egypt, they all are based in one way or another on a revelation a revelation of how one should live that comes from beyond and that legitimates the structure of political authority. And I mean it in that abstract sense. And that does not, um, it, and Hobbes is an answer to that uh, as well. Hobbes is offered a way of us thinking about how we rule over each other that, um, allows us to avoid having to refer to the authority of God. And Hobbes did not do that by refuting 
political theology, any one particular th th uh, political theology or p political theology as such. He simply changed, shifted our attention to why it is we believe in political theologies at all. Hobbes offered another path. I'm not saying that it's one everyone can take and should take. On the contrary, I think not. I think that Hobbes um, came up with an alternative to all political theologies through a crisis in a particular political theology. And that's why when we look at uh, where Professor Casanova and I agree, I think not only should we look for um, uh, liberal, for, um, uh, liberal democratic forms to arise in areas that have not gone through this history, we also shouldn't even be talking about the problem of secularization in areas that have not been touched by Christian revelation and its particular problems. Thank you, professors. Uh, we'll now move to the student question portion of the lecture. I'd ask you to take your places at either side of the microphones. We want to give as many students as possible a chance to have the opportunity to challenge our speakers. So I'm going to ask you to be as concise as possible when asking your questions. And on one final note, at each lecture, we give out the hardball award to the person who asked the most challenging and thoughtful question, and last lecture's winner is Natasha Go. If you wish to be considered for the award, please state your first name and your last name clearly. However, you should beware if you ask a particularly easy question to our speakers, in which case the shameful softball award awaits for you. Now, my co-director thinks I'm a little bit crazy for threatening to do this because I have really bad aim, but uh, I wanted to warn you that if you ask a really easy question, you may want to duck. All right, let's get started. Please. I don't want to be considered for having the ball thrown at me, but uh, I, I, do, I actually quite appreciate uh, the approach you take to the subject, which almost took it out of the context of America and a place where we're greatly politically interested and where discourse uh, about religion and public life uh, takes a much more Struck me. Whoa. Struck. It works. The, so I, I I filibustered for long enough for them to get a mic. The thing the thing I wonder or that strikes me about the secularist movement is I've seen them offering a, a, a set of values often or moral judgments to supplant religion, and in many ways I wonder if, if we might consider anyone offering uh, a, a moral uh, menu uh, within our political discourse as, as really offering us a religious choice or, or their revelation for us to take to the sphere. And I'm, I'm kind of disturbed that we, we don't make, uh, that we seem to distinguish between the religious and the secular when I really feel that both parties are offer, offering us a moral choice or moral menu. Brief response, Professor. I, I don't understand the question. <laughs> may, may, may I give a comment? Um, Obama, mm -hmm. in his inaugural speech, we know that this is the place when American civil religion is defined. He added to the typical Protestant and Catholic Jew, Muslim, Buddhist, or Hindu, also secular humanists and atheists for the first time. I mean, if anything, when I talk of American denominationalism, the system was meant for religious people. And it was, if you wish, the non-religious that had been within the system that discriminated minority. Now, it is not surprising that under those conditions, there is a kind of a, 
emergence of secular humanism as a reaction to the Christian right. It was the Christian right, or it was the Baptist, actually, that began talking of secular humanism in the 60s. First as a kind of negative uh, name, but then was taken as a, as a kind of self-mobilizing, precisely to counter what was very clearly the emergence of the Christian right. So um, I'm not surprised that there is a need to organize secular humanism in the United States and to mobilize them politically, certainly. Take a question from the side. Sure. Um, I'm Kelly Malahan. I don't think I'm eligible. Um, Sorry, Kelly. This is a question for both of you. Um, you guys have a lot of different theories about uh, how Western societies deal with religion, and you kind of, both of you arrive at individual rights as sort of overriding religion and um, you know, the citizens decide what the religion is or um, something along those lines. Do you think that individual rights in and of themselves are a doctrine that modern societies must take or do you think that there is an alternative um, to individual rights that can coexist with modernity that um, would have some sort of different solution to this question of public religion? It sounds like your question, actually. I will too. Go ahead. Well, uh, free exercise of religion, this, need to me, this new, does not need to mean a purely individualistic conception of religion. That's the important thing. We cannot simply take a Christian conception of religion for religion as such. There are what Hannah Arendt called natal religions, those in which people are born. Judaism is a natal religion. Hinduism is a natal religion. And so the principle of individual human rights is not the issue here has to do with groups that have a right also to maintain their identity in the countries of globalization. This is very much what the Jewish question has been all about, the right of Jews to be differently religious as Christ, as, than Christians. And more and more in our global world, we need other categories of defending the right of being religious, but not purely as an individual human right because then it leads to the whole issue of proselytism and how some religions, very much uh, some other cultures, of course, feel threatened by an evangelical, individualistic conception, Christian conception of religion. So uh, it is an important moment that freedom of religion, interestingly, has become one of the cores of individual human rights. But it is a problematic conception once the, uh, the system becomes globalized. Yeah, I guess my answer to the question is that there is no alternative uh, to ascribing to individuals the right to worship as they wish, but we need to appreciate how many different uh, forms of uh, religious worship, individual and communal, are possible within uh, or, or, or under that, uh, with that assumption. Uh, the only place where there's friction, it seems to me, um, is on the right to exit community. That a conception of individual rights to worship can leave room for people to educate their children communally, to have a part of the city where, uh, as you know, I, I live in Brooklyn and I live, I'm surrounded by Hasids, and there are wires up in all the neighborhoods, places you, that you can walk on Saturday. Uh, the elevators run all day on, on Friday night. There are all sorts of things you can do to accommodate communities and to allow communities to govern themselves. The only thing that we have to insist on is that if an individual wants to leave, he or she can. That's pretty much the only strict constraint. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. From the side, please. Hello, my name is Alex Stein. My question actually segues really well from that with accommodating other uh, certain kinds of religious practices with um, Sharia courts and Jewish courts being involved in domestic issues in some democratic societies today. I was wondering how you both felt about the impact of these courts on democracy and if they should be limited to domestic issues like divorce and child support they could be expanded to criminal issues and what impact that has on the performance of the regular government courts. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and that touches a bit on, on what I was just talking about. Um, I don't have any firm, firm views about it, though um, uh, when the Archbishop of Canterbury spoke up on it, uh, I realized where for me uh, at least there's a line to be drawn. 
And that is whether the decisions in these courts have standing outside of the community. That seems to me, again, fundamental that we say they do not. They do not have standing in courts of law in a, a, um, a democratic um, republic. However, within that, as long as within that envelope, I think that there are creative solutions possible. Um, however, keeping in mind that they're possible here and maybe not elsewhere. Um, you know, it, uh, the reaction to the, the statement of the Archbishop of Canterbury was interesting to sort of watch country by country how, how people reacted. Uh, there was outrage in France about it, uh, a little bit but not much in Germany. Um, and all of these reactions had to do with uh, not only sort of national psychodramas about uh, religion and politics, but also have to do with their own traditions and also the elasticity of the societies themselves. We're a big country, we're a diverse country, we're comfortable with that. It's possible for um, these sorts of courts perhaps to exist and have limited jurisdiction, and they aren't going to be very prominent. However, when you have a tradition of struggle over legitimate authority, as you do in modern French history, the long struggle from the revolution on over um, uh, uh, laïcité, then I would say it's a bad idea in France. I don't have an a priori view on it, but I do think no matter what the country is, that um, I would be very wary, in fact, I would say one should not allow the decisions of these courts to have standing outside of the community. Very briefly, le legal uniformity is key to the structure of the modern state as it develops out of hubs. And here I will agree that the relevance of hubs here but of course, in other places where you could not impose this uniformity without a lot of ethno-religious cleansing, this was not possible. In India, you could not. You have to create a structure also to open up different types of jurisdictions, even legal pluralism. I'm not saying that this is a solution, but the more plural, the more diverse societies become, the more creative they will have to become in also accommodating different systems of law, even in the early modernity. There was a multiplicity of legal systems. The uniformity of the whole legal system, of course, comes out of the modern democratic revolutions. And it's having to do very much with the uh, kind of the general will and the need for everybody to conform to, to, to the rule of the majority. And I think that we need to uh, open up to conditions where real diversity emerges and to be creative without undermining the fundamental principles of equality and liberty. And the question is, of course, we know that even these two principles are always in conflict. So we have to find creative solutions to how uh, uh, response to these questions. Issues of gender and religion are going to be a key contested issue for the next, for many, many decades. And they all are going to be around the kind of question you have addressed. Thanks, Alex. Briefly, Zohar. I just wanted uh, to Professor Leela to inquire into the narrative that you began your discussion with. Um, you used the word Christianity, but I was wondering, I guess, firstly, how, when does Christianity begin? Is it with this mythical tale of the crucifixion or with Constantine? Um, and related to this, um, because my, my real question is, to what extent God has to be comprehensive in our worldview to constitute a theology? Um, and if you define theology as being a comprehensive view of God, then I would, I would question that and wonder whether theology itself is already incomprehensive, whether in the very concept of theology there isn't a divide between the theos and the logos, where the very act of translating metaphysics into the world of discourse represents the ultimate problem of representation, one which Plato recognized without being a theologian, um, and that the question of representation is one which not only plagued sort of the, med the medieval theologians, but uh, us today when we think about representation in, in the modern sphere. So I, I agree that theology is important, but I want to know whether it's comprehensive. Um, and so I guess we got a lot of questions on the table one here. One final point. Ab Abraham mentions God as the judge without receiving anything from God saying, I'm the judge. And his question to God is, will not the God of all the earth deal justly? To me, this already anticipates Hobbes. 
Abraham already invokes human nature, some argument for justice independent of this God. Oh, well, there, well, there are too many questions there for me to answer. Um, and some of them are above my pay grade. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I want to take one part of that that I thought uh, worth commenting on and maybe also correcting something um, I said or, or nuancing what I said. And that is that I said that not theology, uh, well, I did not say just that, but political theology, the attraction of political theology is that it's comprehensive. Comprehensive in the sense that, uh, or, or rather, the political theologies of Judaism and Islam are comprehensive because they offer a law that um, uh, both prescribes or gives advice on every aspect of human life, right? But it is true that um, one can have a political theology you might even call it a negative political theology, where um, uh, God leaves us a lot of room to figure it out, right? Where um, we learn from our reading of uh, the Bible, that, uh, or let's say the New Testament, that we're fallen creatures, and we've read our St. Augustine, and we learn not to expect too much of ourselves, and we realize that between now and then, we've got to deal, between now and redemption, we've got to deal with fallen human beings. God doesn't give us a lot of uh, specific rules in the New Testament. In fact, there are none. So we've got to work this out ourselves. We have to make the assumption that human beings are sinful, and we can make a lot of Habesian assumptions about people, right? And we've got to figure out how we're to live together and live decently within that. Um, so it's possible to have a loose political theology that is like that, but the assumption is still that God has legitimate authority over us. He has only um, passed that on to us by absenting himself so we can deal with ourselves after the fall. Thank you, Professor. It looks like we've got one more question. Hi, you may have just answered uh, what my question was trying to get at, but. I guess I had a question for Professor, Professor um, Leela about how you were defining political theology. When you were talking about the comparative political theologies, you, you used the example, example of the emperor. And I guess my question in, in bare bones is, when you were defining politi political theology, were you assuming a sort of an author authoritarian political theology? Or more in line with the answer you were just giving you're still fading out. Can you speak oh, up there? I guess my question was, when, as you're defining political theology, are you impl is there an implicit as assumption you're working with that it would have to correspond to some sort of author authoritarian worldly component or parallel or more in lines with the answer you just gave? Would that just not, would a more, would, would the answer you just gave to you in your mind not really be a political theology or would, is, I guess my question is, is there that tension within political theology itself between authoritarianism and anti-authoritarianism? Anti -authoritarianism? Anti -authoritarianism. Yeah. yeah, I see your point. Yeah. No, the distinction is between authoritarianism, being authoritarian and being authoritative. And political theology establishes legitimate authority. Um, that need not, that doesn't mean that we're destined to live with bullies as um, as our rulers. Um, let me give you an example of someone who is, I think, um, well, I'm not sure quite how to read him, but someone who sounds like a uh, negative political theologian, that is a political theologian who sees God to be rather absent, and that's Reinhold Niebuhr. Niebuhr takes the Augustinian um, assumption that human beings are fallen, and that in thinking about not only uh, how to structure a decent society, but also what we do uh, in times of conflict, how we deal with war, we have to assume we're dealing with, and that we're on our own, figuring out how to deal with fallen creatures. Nonetheless, the authoritative voice, we do hear an authoritative voice, and that's the voice of prophecy. That you can have a prophetic political theology where the role of the prophet 
is to call individuals and rulers to listen to God's word and to behave and to rule justly. Without that person himself taking the authority to rule. I could say more about that, um, but that offers um, another picture of what a political theology might look like. If I may add, I think that where precisely we may have a slight disagreement is for me, political theology emerges only with axiality in the axial age with the emergence of transcendence. Before, all systems were purely immanent. Sacrality was immanent. The sacred king, sacred society, sacred kinship, there was no transcendent point from which to precisely criticize or judge the immanent order. What axiality means, whether it is Confucian ethics, whether it is the Buddha, whether it is the Old Testament prophets, whether it is Plato, allegory of the cave, is precisely the emergence of some kind of universal principles ethical principles from which to judge the ruler. And this is, of course, the emergence of a new type of political theology. Now, the does become again immersed in empires and fuse. But from now on, the possibility of principles of political theology from which to desacralize existing orders have been uh, something possible in all axial civilizations. Well, there, there we do disagree because um, I think that once you have transcendence, you get certain kind of political theology, but before, um, you know, that um, there is an Egyptian political theology. There is a Babylonian political theology. The story of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh is a drama in part about political theology, but that comes to, down to how we define these terms, I suppose. All right, with that, it's, oh, yes, Laura. Sorry, one last question, just quickly. Um, Professor Casanova, um, you talked earlier about um, the sort of uh, ironic situation between Europe and the United States, where in the United States we we um, we I'm sorry, I'm I'm going blank. In Europe, people are more religious than they say they are, and in the United States, people are less religious than they say they are. Is that maybe not a coincidence? That is, in the United States, we have this secular society, and maybe that's why we tend to be more religious? Does that make sense? Uh, it's, I don't know whether we, when you say we, I, I am both European and American, I'm caught in between. And I think that the fundamental difference is Europeans experience becoming modern as becoming free from the confessional identities which they're imposed to them. Europeans, underst Americans understand their religious identities as a voluntary identity they assume in relation to other religious identities. And the fundamental question is the possibility of changing them. The last Pew survey indicated that 28% of American adults claim that they have a different religion than they had as children. If you add people who change Protestant denominations, it is 44% of American adults change their religious identity. In Europe, this is unthinkable. The only change is from your confessional identity to secular identity. There is no other religious dynamic in Europe. There are small conversions of minorities to this religion and other, but there is really no other possibility. So you don't have any theories about why, why there's this pull in the United why? States because as opposed to Europe? Here, the religious identities are a process of becoming modern through mobilization, through citizenship, so they are tied. While they are in the process of becoming modern, people had to free themselves from what were considered pre-modern identities. So they are viewed as liberation, while here is a way in which people assume their voluntary collective identities in relation to other groups. No, if, I, if I understood the question, I mean, this is sort of interesting, sort of the sociology of lying. I never really thought about that. And your answer, Jose, ex help, may help explain why Europeans underreport their um, religious practices, but it doesn't tell us quite why Americans overreport. Do you have a thought about that? Well, what we have is, of course, uh, uh, 
anecdotal evidence from Eisenhower on saying that I don't care which religion Americans have as long as they have a religion. When I said that the really, really uh, 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 kind of underprivileged minority in America are the secular humanists in this respect, I mean, we know from surveys that people are sooner, are more willing to elect a Muslim as president, even today, than an atheist. Now, this implies somehow there is a collective norm built into American political culture that somehow, and this is something which Tocqueville explained, despite this diversity, there's a fundamental aspects of American civil religion and being religious, uh, but in this particular Republican way is one of them. And uh, the interesting question is why immigrants, the moment they come here, adopt this identity. Even, let's say, Soviet Jews, that when they come here, they had no relation with American Jews because they could understand their Judaism as religion. For them, Judaism was a national, national identity, was put in their passport, and they wanted to free themselves from it. So they were not eager to become Jews in America. And yet, the longer they are here, the more identify Judaism with religion and are willing to join Jewish religious associations. So this fact, that this is the way in which America has structured its pluralism. Perhaps the answer is because the alternative is racism. Race and religion have been the two ways of structuring American pluralism. And most people prefer to construct their identities around religion, certainly minorities, I would say, than around race. Thank you, professors. All right, with that, we're going to conclude the formal lecture. We invite you to join us out in the lobby to further the conversation or at lunch with the Janus Fellows tomorrow at 12 at the Faculty Club. And uh, please join me in thanking the professor once again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.